Welcome. And by the way, for those of you who uh, wanted to know, uh, I hope you've been enjoying the music from uh, the great Ruben Johnson, who is uh, no biased at all, but just happens to be an artist that, that, that we managed and we've been playing his music before the sessions. Hope you've been enjoying that. I'm Paul Brindley. This is day three of Sandbox Summit Global. I'm not going to give you the full music ally spiel today. Suffice to say, if you don't know who we are, do have a look at our website. Thanks again, as ever, to Linkfire, Chartmetric and MQA, who you will be hearing from today. And uh, oh well, who you could have met, but all the slots have gone for the uh, meetings at the end of the day today. Uh, the online directory, though, is still live. And uh, I know that a lot of you have now put your profiles in there. So do please get along and uh, register, yourselves, uh, register yourselves on there using the access code SSG20. The information about that will be uh, in the chat. Keep a look out for that. Net networking roulette, uh, we had another session today. We'll be taking place uh, tomorrow. And it is a first come, first serve. Again, just uh, note down the links and, and turn up for that. Now, today, we're going to be doing, uh, well, there's the opportunity for more questions, but they will always be after each session because there's just not time basically to kind of build in that sort of interactivity. But we're asking the speakers to stick around um, after their sessions to answer some questions, but please pop them in the Q&A and, you know, pop them in at the end of the session because that's uh, when they'll get the chance to hopefully ask, answer your questions. And do remember to come along on Friday. You can ask uh, digital marketing experts some questions and you can vote in the campaign of the year and please use uh, the hashtag Sandbox Summit. So let's uh, move on and uh, see what we're going to be looking at in a little bit more detail today. Four sessions. Um, now, I really do have to thank um, Shira Kanishkawi from um, Spotify, who has helped us uh, well, and basically put together the first two sessions. It's been really fabulous working with these guys, and uh, I hope you enjoy those two sessions. They'll sort of roll on one into uh, another on genreless playlists and the future of playlists. You're then going to be hearing from uh, some of the Music Allied team who will take you through six of the uh, leading uh, DSP dashboard tools. And finally, uh, Mike Jabara from our good friends at MQA will be chairing a panel looking at how DSPs uh, differentiate themselves uh, in the streaming world. And yeah, finally, for those of you who have booked, uh, there's uh, meetings with the MQA and Music Ally teams. But let's kick off right away. And it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Henriette Heimdall um, from CD Baby, who's going to be chairing these two sessions. Henriette, who many of you will have seen on the Music Ally TV shows. And uh, over to you, Henriette, to introduce the first panel. Thank you, Paul. Um, hi, everybody. Welcome. And thank you so much, Music Ally, for hosting us for the two following sessions on playlisting. Um, as Paul mentioned, the first topic that we're going to be covering today is all about genreless playlists. And these are playlists such as Oyster and Lorem that don't paint themselves into a corner. Um, they open up for a wide variety of genres, which really reflect the way that many fans consume music on streaming services today. Um, so I just want to introduce our three amazing panelists from Spotify that first off will give a brief introduction and give kind of an overview of, of genreless playlists. And then we will follow up with some questions. And as Paul mentioned, please put questions in the Q&A function and then we'll try to answer as many as we can afterwards. Um, so our three lovely panelists. First off, we have Iman Hassi, who's a senior editor for Spotify in Sweden. He's responsible for curating playlists such as Oyster, 100 and its hits. And he's previously been at Nike and Sadius Radio, or Sweden's radio. Next up, we've got Sofia Olofsson. She's also a senior editor at, uh, at Spotify and a studio manager. Um, she's been there for over seven years and focuses on developing playlist development and creating and exploring venues for artist storytelling. And last but not least, Lizzie, who will also be joining us for the next session. She's a senior editor at Spotify in the US and she oversees curation for playlists like Fresh Finds and Lorem, Internet People and loads other that champion emerging talent and engage younger audiences. So without further ado, please um, start your presentation. Thank you so much, Henriette. Let's get going. <laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs> okay. Genreless playlists. 
<laughs> Hold on. There we go. Yeah, so I can start a bit. Um, and as, as Henriette mentioned, um, I've been at Spotify for, for seven years. I actually started when the editorial playlist feature was launched on Spotify in 2013. Uh, and ever since back then, we've been analyzing listening behaviors among our users. So from the get go, we had playlists that focused on genre and both like discovery and cataloging genre. And we also identified a need to curate for moods and moments lists. So moods and moments, you know, our playlist for, for dinner or workout or party, that was really a reaction to how we view that people listen to music. Uh, and a few years into this playlist curation world, we realized that, okay, now we have these, these two very distinct ways of listening, but not all artists or creators or, or even the audience listen or create like that. We realized there was um, a gap where we needed to, to curate for culture rather than, than, um, than genres. And we would say that genres is still super important, of course, but genres are expanding and artists are experimenting with them. And uh, a big, big, con like the, the consequence uh, or reason that this happened, we believe, is the digital transition that people actually have access to all kinds of music now. Um, both uh, Lissy, Iman, and myself are uh, very much like when we were kids buying buying a CD was a super conscious choice, like, because you chose what you spent your money on. Boxing yourself into one genre had a purpose because, like, you only had that one allowance, so you didn't want to risk it on anything that you might not end up liking. Uh, but with having access to everything through the digital transition and, and Spotify and things like that, um, suddenly it's, it's no risk at all to experiment and try new things and explore. And we believe that that is a big reason why genres are expanding and people are listening based on culture rather than, than just identifying with one type of genre space. Okay. Um, you guys, we, we made a deck for this because it is like the most Spotify thing that we could do. Uh, in like at least 50% of meetings at Spotify, someone has made a beautiful deck so we had a lot of templates to play with and we thought we would give you the Spotify experience by uh, <laughs> <laughs> making a full deck for you. Um, but yeah, Sophia uh, makes some great points. We, you know, genre is still totally important. Uh, it's historically how we categorize, categorize music. Um, and, uh, you know, yeah, it's, but we've realized today, um, you know, that the way people listen uh, is, is more community-based. Um, so, you know, if you take things like Pollen, Oyster, Lorem, uh, these are listening communities that we've seen, you know, on Spotify, off Spotify, on social media, um, you know, that, that really, sh I think they, you know, share a lot in common with uh, the artists that we are, you know, putting in these playlists. Um, so, you know, it's driven by culture, and it's driven by these communities, um, you know, and this is a place where these communities can really see themselves on Spotify. And that's something that we felt like we were missing. So we're experimenting with. Iman? Um, yeah, I would like to actually talk about the next slide, please. Um, okay. This thing right here, um, like the explorer mindset, obviously like there isn't a one-stop shot answer um, in terms of the question of how we're less wedded to genres and genre boundaries. Um, but there's a number of synergies applied over time, I believe. Uh, I personally attribute like a lot to the internet, the sharing of thoughts and ideas and expressions in the technology we receive to explore more uh, has had an exponential growth. Um, and maybe everybody isn't an explorer, but like the explorer mindset has always been a natural human trait across recorded history. Uh, like if I go back to myself as a young kid, uh, connected myself to everybody else's hard drive, trying to figure out different like discographies and, and see what's going on in the 70s rock world. Like I've heard about that Zeppelin and Woodstock, but I don't know what it is, et cetera, et cetera. And you could grasp a lot, grasp like the history of sounds, eras and cultural expressions, which you weren't like uh, able to, um, 
to um, take a dive into basically and take a look at it. Um, I grew up in northern parts of Sweden where it was like a lot of snow and a lot of elks and reindeers. Um, but being an immigrant kid, my uh, parents always had satellite dishes. So we were the, ones, the, one, the only ones to basically be able to watch MTV uh, and experience new ways of, of, of art and deciphering what's going on in new cultures around the world compared to my friends and my peers. So I think with that like information bank becoming more and more open and um, the more spices that are available for your dish that you're trying to create as an artist, um, it makes you know the culture transition in terms of a way that uh, the palates of the audiences changes as well and they become more accustomed to stuff um, that they can grasp with these um, new opportunities to to um, dive into different worlds so what we're trying to do me Sophie and Lizzie is basically be the waiters of trying to contextualize and present these beautiful dishes that the creators do and make as chefs in the best way possible for the audiences to enjoy um, so basically the more spices to create with for the artists and the creators the more spices to try out, the more spices to try out becomes a creative feedback loop and it's becoming like a less more um, or a less rigid structure around it. So if culture is moving that fast and moving at that rate, uh, we need to move with it, um, I would say. Um, so the next slide, please. That's when we like question um, the status quo in terms of programming. Um, Sophia mentioned a little bit, like none of us, Lizzie or Sophia or me, have the same type of musical background, but we all listen to various genres, expression and aesthetics, and we love music. Um, and we might be you know, the music loving minority that likes to explore uh, more than many other audiences, but that minority that loves music will never become a majority if we don't uh, question the current way of doing things. Um, I would say like, Sophia, you mentioned the fact that Moons and Moment playlists were a reaction to the fact that maybe an avid synth pop fan uh, might not always want to listen to Depeche Mode while cooking dinner for the family. Maybe like soulful dinner with the likes of Al Green and Anita Baker is much more of a relevant back backdrop to your evening, uh, even if you like used to rock undercut back in the day. So we're basically testing the limits um, and learn as we go along how to cater the best way possible for both listeners and, and creators. And with that being said, the curation is of essence, is of essence in, this, in this case. Uh, if you wanna make sure that Explorer has a pleasant, pleasant sonical experience, uh, the one key factor is trust. Next slide, please. So, and that's what we're trying to establish right here, uh, trust over time. So um, if you suddenly like get a new spice in your dish, you're more inclined to try it regardless of what you consider yourself liking beforehand. Um, because your trust to the establishment is regardless of what they put in front of you, i.e. the trusted curation, which leads us to our established playlist brands around the world. You can take it over, guys. Yeah, and, uh, you know, to start with, uh, and we can kind of look through these, I mean, you know, uh, hopefully you guys are somewhat familiar with, with these playlists, um, but at the end of the day, uh, or I guess at the beginning of the day, they're just a name, you know, slapped on a list of songs. So at its very core, that's, that's what it is. And we hoped that, you know, with design and the right mix of artists and just being able to speak to, uh, you know, these avid music fans, that it would become something more. Um, but, you know, it really started as an experiment. Uh, with exactly that. So, you know, now we've got, uh, we can go back. We've got Pollen, um, amazing playlist, you know, uh, probably one of the first, if not the first experiment into this. Um, Lorem, which, uh, you know, has, a, I think, a, a very distinct audience um, and, you know, maybe share some similar qualities as Pollen, but, uh, you know, we're, we're really, targeting like a, a different a different type of person here um and then oyster is the answer in the nordic exactly because that's like pollen and lorem were launched before oyster and we've we've had great help with from you guys um on like building this world uh, for the nordics because our region is has a really strong alternative legacy with the likes of you know bjork and the knife Lickily. Um, 
that has really been pioneers in this this world that we're working uh, with in this playlist. Um, so for us to create a space for for a new generation uh, of artists in that space, both international and, and Nordic ones that can live side by side, um, has been super, super stimulating uh, this year that we work with Oyster. So, you know, another part that we really thought was important uh, was that if we were taking a different approach with these playlists, they should look different. Uh, if someone's opening up Spotify and, you know, expecting to find something that speaks to them, it should look like, you know, maybe the social media outlets they're looking at, magazines they're reading, um, music sites that they're frequenting, and, you know, so there, there should be a little bit of like call to action with, you know, a little bit of mystery, a little bit of, um, you know, yeah, a little bit of like echoing uh, the experience that they're about to have. So that is why our design is, is so important and we've been able to, you know, be a bit more playful uh, in that sense. Yeah, and, and speaking of playful and challenging the status quo, <laughs> we also like to explore when it comes to playlists as a format. Uh, and one of the ways that we do that in is that both Pollen and Oyster has attached studio programs where we invite artists to our studios uh, at the Spotify office um, to record uh, tracks. It could be covers or original tracks or, or collabs um, that we release within this space. Uh, and in a specific studio program attached to the playlists. Uh, and on the next slide, you could see uh, three artists that we have worked with for, uh, for Studio Oyster. Lil Halima is out on Friday, shameless plugging <laughs> from my end, but uh, it's a really, really great song. Um, and as you can see, these are the visual assets um, from the three different releases and marketing campaign, and they are super different because we want the artist to really be the backbone of our studio programs that we work with in Studio Oyster. Um, so rather than us fitting them into like our, our visual format, we, we take them into the Oyster world and have them sort of shape it the way that they express themselves. Um, yes. And this is also uh, we do we do visual content in video form as well, uh, where we shape it almost as little mini music videos. Uh, and we included one here to really show you um, how much of, of the artist identity uh, we, we use when we create these videos. I see if it works. Yeah. Oh, there's no sound. This always happens no matter how much you rehearse <laughs> when you're supposed to show video in. Uh, uh, but this is also uh, on YouTube, so you can find it if you search for uh, Sassy009, uh, who is uh, a super cool uh, electronic artist from Norway. Uh, I really encourage you both to listen to her music uh, and to watch this video material. Yeah, yeah maybe we can, we can send a link in, uh, yeah. in the chat. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, one thing that uh, I don't know if we've explicitly mentioned throughout this, but um, you know, in that this is a playlist format, and we're you know now experimenting with going beyond. You know, how can we contextualize further? How can we give uh, artists a bit you know more room to express themselves, or um, you know show a little bit of who they are? How can users you know uh, gain trust in this? It's the reason you know we're we're inspired by these artists. And where, where it really works is when we let these artists speak on behalf of, you know, these brands, I guess, is what, is what they really are, is these Spotify brands. They are artist-led. They're for artists to express themselves, um, you know, and in describing them, you know, these, these names, Lauren, Paul, and Oyster, the, the artists, you know, are the ones that are really defining what these, quote, genres are, genre lists whatever our communities are and these fan bases love that because they feel you know a relation to to those artists and you know the more that we can introduce similar artists new artists artists with these you know kind of forward thinking whatever the the case is for each of these playlists the better um and you know really try our best through our platform to to connect them 
because at its you know at its core, Iman, Sophia, and I are just music fans, and and we're and we're watching and and trying to you know kind of analyze and contextualize however we can. But the more that we can let the artist speak on our behalf, the better. Yeah, and really going from being not only the place where they can upload their music, but also be like a creative partner and and in the studio, for example, be an enabler of of uh, creativity and visions that they that they can realize uh, in our studio yeah, and at its core like lorem literally means nothing uh, <laughs> the word, the word no. like uh, pollen <laughs> is is attached or like very much uh, when you when you talk about it you think about allergies and, and oyster is just a mollusk you know i'm saying like yeah. it's animal. so the the added value <laughs> comes from the artist community of what they what they do and what 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 the intricacies are of what they create uh, and that adds value to, to the names and that, that more steers what, what it is for, for um, listeners and audiences rather than Spotify uh, creating a specific brand for you to enjoy and, and you know, um, use as a genre. Uh, it's more artist led uh, and, and community led rather than being led from us. And we're just happy observers trying to contextualize for the audiences. Uh, so, I mean, we don't really need to, uh, go too deep into this one, but, you know, I guess, uh, they caused a, a bit of a stir and that's a good thing because it just brings more attention to these artists and communities. And that was at the end of the day, our, our goal and, and always our goal moving forward. Um, and some amazing coverage here on, on Studio Oyster. I think Iman and Sophia have done such a great job with that and, so much more to come, pollen singles, uh, and hopefully some more on the way um, in the next couple months for Lauren. Uh, we included this because this is this is a fun part. It's definitely one of the most fun parts of my day to kind of check in and see uh, what fans are saying and how people are interpreting what we do, um, you know, whether it's Lorem or something like the hyperpop community or the internet people community, um, pollen, oyster, just how people are interpreting them and, uh, you know, seeing a connection to each other through these playlists. Um, I think there's, <laughs> there was one, uh, this one right here, I don't know if you can see in the, in the kind of bottom right hand corner is my favorite tweet. Um, write a <laughs> sentence, write a sentence only your fandom would understand. I'm going to use the Lauren playlist as the dating app. Um, <laughs> one, one time Conan Gray tweeted that and deleted it and his fans never let it go and still tweeted about it like months later. And so it became kind of like an inside joke within the playlist. And, uh, yeah, I mean, that's kind of the most that we can hope for because that's literally, you know, the listeners seeing themselves in a community um, and we don't need to define it. We don't need to, you know, tell them what Laura means. We don't need to do anything beyond that. Um, you know, they're, they're already connecting with each other and that's that, that sort of interactivity of fans and artists and our platform being the means for that is uh, that's what we're here to do. All right. Claire is going to take us into some conclusions before Q&A. <laughs> um, so number one, listening and artist communities. I think we've uh, completely gone over that and how important that is. Um, genres are still absolutely important. They uh, are the inspiration. They are the historical categorization of our music. And, um, you know, they're still listening experiences to be had, listening to a genre playlist, searching for a certain genre, creating for a certain genre, um, you know, listening within a different mood, whether it's dinner or a workout or whatever, and we can get into all the intricacies in there. Um, but these specific, you know, genreless playlists, community-based playlists uh, are really our answer, our experimentation with connecting a listening and artist community. Um, number two, how you can get involved is uh, we religiously go through our uh, submissions 
uh, in our Spotify submission form on Spotify for Artists. So if you do not have Spotify for, for Artists, tap into that as soon as you can because you can look at your data, you can understand your audience, you can understand where they're coming from, how they're interacting with you. And most importantly for the playlist system, you can submit your music for playlists. Um, and number three, you know, again, these playlists, uh, they're, they're a beginning to, to this concept and they are specifically made to evolve with the users, our listeners and artists. So, uh, you know, within those communities, within these, you know, new sounds, new experimentations, um, you know, we're, we're here for the ride and, uh, we want to be able to support what's going on off platform on platform, um, in the best way we can. Bam. Uh, thank you so much guys. Um, I guess, I, I guess if I'm a label or a manager, somebody working with an artist and listening to your presentation, kind of the first thing that will pop into my mind or the, the first question that I would have is you're talking about genreless playlists. Um, how do you pitch that? Like, how, will it become more difficult to get your music in front of the right curators? And how, as somebody working with an artist, should you kind of be describing your music, tagging your music to make sure that it ends up in front of the right person and, and to be considered for these genreless playlists? Um, I think that's a, a great question. Um, it, uh, you know, in our, in our submission process, you're able to apply like I think five different, you know, genre and subtype genres to, uh, to, to your submission. And, you know, we're even every day kind of thinking like, okay, what can we introduce that, that kind of makes this a little bit easier for artists. Um, I think we've got meme rap in the works, <laughs> uh, hyper pop, uh, in the works. Um, you know, things like that, just to, to kind of reflect, you know, what's going on, new genres. But I think also, maybe not a misconception, but, um, you know, some, these are a mix of genres, too. So being a genreless playlist, yes, sometimes the music can sit, you know, comfortably in between two, three, four genres or be a completely new sound. And you can apply, you know, music that's, that's or uh, labels, I guess, that, that are similar. Um, or, you know, whatever, so, so that you can, um, yeah, just, just, uh, yeah, but, um, yeah, these playlists are, they're a mix, they're a mix of genres, um, you know. Yeah, so, so you're, you're talking about the variety of music that you include, include on these lists. Are there any sort of limitations to you guys as editors or, you know, the curators of these lists in terms of how promiscuous you can be in your choices? Like, can you include black metal and jazz on the same list? Or how, how do you go about kind of developing the, the individual brands for the playlists and make sure what the parameters are within that? I mean, yeah, <laughs> do the food I, analogy. Yeah, no, I think you start somewhere. <laughs> like, I think you start somewhere. I, I, I don't think you can go from like A to Z. I think you need to have some sort of like um, staircase analogy in terms of like introducing something, see how that reacts, see how the community reacts to it, uh, see where our culture is going within the community, see what they're susceptible to in terms of sounds, et cetera, et cetera. And, and by, by that case, take one step forward in terms of what you said in terms of trying to trying to pitch your music or or, or, or stuff like that it's it's the same thing from there and as well as, as creators like give us the most um information as possible so we can uh, apply that to our playlist as well and see how that correlates between the artists and creators and and the spaces we're trying to create for the audiences so i think that's the best way to talk about it in terms of like okay uh we have this new spice uh that we can work with because we've seen it within our submission forms um, how do we work with that uh, and which spaces can we uh, apply that to um, and, and, and I would like to reiterate the fact that we, we aren't like one editor sitting working on one playlist we talk amongst ourselves all the time so maybe Lizzie talks to somebody else in Norway or in um, Germany or that comes my way and we talk about how we work within these different playlists if, if something is happening on our local intricate you know uh, spaces within the Nordics or what's happening over 
here or whatever. Um, so I think it's just like, it's not a monolithic um, way of seeing the world because the world doesn't work as a monolith, you know? Um, so we all, always have to have these um, flowing conversations about what's going on and, and hopefully we can cover as much as possible. And uh, yeah, and it's a bandwidth thing, thing as well. I, I mean, I would hope that we could work solely on these playlists and, and see how that would affect and, and work within the music industry. But for now, this is our first step uh, forward and hopefully we can do and, and, and encourage to experiment more and question the, the terms of programming as it's mentioned. I think, I think what you're saying there in terms of kind of fan reaction is a really interesting point um, and kind of keen to dig a little bit more into that because for, from a personal perspective, I've worked with emerging artists that have had numerous new Music Friday placements, for instance, but then as soon as they've managed to get a Lauren placement, for instance, I've seen that the numbers that they can get from a, from a playlist like that, it's just, it's 10 times or it's 20 times in certain instances, streams. Um, so I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about kind of this, the potential successes of, like how do you see they genreless playlists play a part in, a, in a, an emerging artist or an artist career development? You know, especially with, uh, with Lauren, there's a very specific, you know, discovery oriented listener in mind. Um, someone that, you know, uh, in particular is not ashamed to listen to popular music, mainstream music, you know, you wouldn't think, but Harry Styles, uh, Post Malone, you know, I guess Billie Eilish is mainstream, but still absolutely core lorem, you know, listener. But you can have those types of artists in there. And then, uh, you know, we love to experiment with like, not even experiment, but just, you know, have full confidence in someone that's emerging and, and on the way and, and uh, you know, put them in there. And, and I think for the listeners, they're just, to a mom's point, uh, we've built up trust. You know, we've, we've done our, our homework, but we also, we just absolutely, you know, love that music. I, I feel like, you know, every, everything I'm trying to add to Lauren is, is something I absolutely love. So if I'm having that connection with that music and really understanding that community of, of listeners, um, you know, I, I'm, I have confidence that they're going to love it too. And that's kind of, kind of how, um, you know, aside from just, you know, letting, letting it be artist led, how we're kind of building that trust. So I feel like, you know, if you're discovering music in there, um, it's a, it's a playlist with a lot of saves uh, because, you know, kids are going in there and, and uh, trying to find something that, you know, they're going to want to listen to for the rest of the day, week, share with their friends. Um, and it's just, that's the habit of that list. Interesting. Um, time is flying, so we only really have time for one more question before we have to jump on the next topic. But I'm, I'm kind of keen to understand if you guys have seen any impact on music creation as a result of how, obviously, playlists play such a huge part in any company's marketing strategy now. And I, I'm keen to know if you've seen any difference in how artists approach creative, the, the creative process as a result of, being given more of an kind of an open canvas to play with. I think for the Nordics, yeah, there you go. Okay, um, you'll have to forgive us. We're we're used to you know just having a normal in person conversation, um, but we're we're trying our best. Um, you know, I think our our hope is that uh, because we've kind of opened. The boxes that creators feel more comfortable um, leaning into whatever new sound that you know they want to experiment with or that they're inspired by um, you know because we're, we're trying to open more doors for them yeah and also I believe like for us creating this playlist was also a reaction to like how artists were were expanding with their with their creation and of course if we can like make that happen even more I think that's excellent but it, it's also something that was happening organically uh, and, and that we just enabled spaces for um, so I mean to your point Sophia it, it, in the Nordics we've historically had a very rich like alternative space uh, yeah 
uh, and stuff like that. But we have never, with Spotify being even Swedish, we never had a space uh, within that space trying to uh, empower it even more, not just reflect it, but also empower it. So um, with the studios program we have, like in Stockholm, in terms of Oyster, Studio Oyster, uh, hopefully that will, you know, um, encourage more creators to uh, take a step out and venture in whatever realm they want to venture in and we can amplify that and, and see where that leads because nobody has the answers to anything but more so make sure that you um, you give some more light and shine to to what is is happening around the world um, yeah and also in a way like again with these people who are ex explorers they tend to also not care so much about like where a song comes from so it also becomes a bit borderless and to me that's super exciting with with launching a playlist like Oyster, if something is working there, I know that like, okay, Lissy, this track is really, it's really something that that's going well for us here. Maybe something to try in Lorem, and and we can just talk to to each other, both as music fans, just like we mentioned a bunch of times, but also in terms of like, hey, there might be something for you in your market in in this this person from from the Nordics. Amazing guys, I think I could talk talk to you guys about this for a really long time, but unfortunately, we have to wrap up. Um, Lizzie will stay on for the next panel as well, but thank you so much to Sophia and Iman. I think thank you guys can stick around and help answer some questions in the Q&A that it's been firing off. So, um, yeah, thank you so much and have a good day, guys. You thank too. You. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. And then I think Paul is bringing in our other panelists for our next session, which is the future of playlists. Hopefully. They will be with us imminently. Perfect. It should be coming up right now. If you want to do the introductions, because I think they'll be popping up any second. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess I can just tell you guys about the next um, session, which is, as you can see, the future of playlisting. Um, we've become uh, we, we, as an industry, we've become really hyper-focused on the importance of these lists. And the question is, will this continue? And will it continue in the same way? Um, how do we see playlists evolve in the next five to 10 years? Um, and we have a bunch of great panelists on this one as well, coming from very different perspectives, which will be very interesting to hear. Um, and as always, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A function so that we can try to answer as many as possible. And I think the guys will stick around after the session to answer as many as they can. Right, so the three panelists that we've got for this is, number one is Ty Bazenden, who is the CEO of Culture. I think I pronounced that right? Yeah. No. <laughs> He's, a, he's an Atlanta native who's mastered the art of marketing independent talent in a major way. Um, culture cultivates an environment to nurture independent talents into business owners that can operate in a global like can operate a global business. Um, he also manages Brent Fayaz, Sonda, and Winter Time. Then we have MXM Tune or Maya, who is a fantastic artist from the US. She's she self releases her music and her music is streamed in the hundreds of millions on Spotify. She's worked with major artists like Carly J, uh, Carly Rae Jepsen, just uh, dropped a single with her, right? And Cave Town, uh, who produced her latest album, and MXM Tune has seen a lot of editorial support uh, for her work, especially across the ones that we mentioned in the previous session. And then we also have Lizzie Charbo, who's a senior editor for Spotify in the US that we that we had on the previous session. She oversees curation for playlists like Fresh Finds, Lorem, Internet People, and loads others that champion emerging talent. Hi guys. Hello. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I think it could be interesting to start with you, Maya, um, as the artist voice on the panel. Um, you've obviously been super successful as a DIY artist and you've had loads of support from editorial teams. Um, could you tell us a little bit about how you currently kind of work or interact with playlists and editors and whether you're really future focused in, in your strategy? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I, I've been working in music for around three years now, so I'm very new to the whole entire music industry and I feel very thankful to have been in a landscape with playlists like Lorem or Pollen or whatever it may be in defining genreless music and um, I think that you know it's been really pivotal for me 
kind of, I want to say like growing up in this era of playlisting as an artist, because I think it's really helped me define my sound, which is odd because it's supposed to be genreless. But um, I look to these playlists because I think that, you know, as an artist, it, it kind of like, it shows me who my peers are when I'm looking at the landscape of artists and who else is out there making music. And I mean, even outside of just being a musician and creating songs, I personally listen to these playlists in my own free time of like listening and finding new music that I really love and enjoy. And um, like Lorem is one of my favorite playlists that I've listened to ever. I, I continuously find myself listening to see what's been added or updated. And um, I think that it, if it does anything, it really just helps me feel like there are less limitations on what I can do with my own art artistry. And so, um, I don't know, I think it's, it's kind of something that I'm slowly realizing is having an effect on my music, but it wasn't something that was like right away, I was like, oh, wow, this is, this is having an influence on me. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's really interesting because so many artists are so hyper focused on it. Like, it's interesting getting a different perspective. Um, I think Ty, do you, I mean, we, we talk about playlists a lot in the music industry, but from your perspective, do you, do you think there's a danger that artists or people that work with art, or industry professionals that work with artists have started to rely too heavily on the idea that playlists as the main means of music discovery and building audiences? Um. Yeah, I would say that anybody in any business that relies too heavily on one source of, I guess, marketing can, you know, it can be a little bit corrupt. I think that for artists, it is very important and their teams just to kind of build a well-rounded a well -rounded business and be aware of the impact that uh, screams could have on sales or that you know it could have on discovery but I do think is uh, financially a uh, business or it's a risk to just lean all those eggs in the basket because you know the fans are everywhere and so you have to try to figure out your best guideline and plan to like tap fans on all the different platforms and figuring out which platform work for which artists, you know, because there may be artists that don't do well on screaming, but they do really well in the sync world, or they do really well touring, um, or just selling vinyls, whatever the case may be. So I think it's not as productive because if you have a client that does not perform well on playlists, well, you're just gonna like give up, <laughs> so. Completely. I mean, Lizzie, from your perspective, as a, as a curator, do you feel like do you feel like the industry and artists have become too hyper focused on it as a sole means of building an audience? I think um, you know, Lorem in particular, uh, it's by far not the biggest playlist on that Spotify has to offer, um, but it connects with a a very specific group of fans. Um, so, you know, our hope is that, you know, artists in that playlist have an, an ability to help grow their, you know, core fan base. Um, and similarly, I think there's so many other avenues to do that. And it's one of the most important things that you can do. So, you know, you, you could get the biggest, um, you know, press look or, you know, Something like it, but maybe it's that smaller, you know, magazine that featured you that you know connects with with you know maybe what could be your potential core audience that's amazing or you know to Ty's point, um, you know there's so many artists that excel in the live space and that is obviously the most difficult thing this year, um, you know and I think as well I'm looking for inspiration, uh, you know not just on how an artist is doing on our platform, but you know who they are, um, you know how how fans are interacting with them, um, how they're showing their personality, uh, you know, so many other factors um, than just you know being on a playlist. And um, I think too, you know, it's it's really important. Um, Ty and I have actually talked about this. To you know, getting on a playlist is is one step one stool, oh, one, one tool. Um, but, you know, once someone 
is, is into you, finds you on a playlist, if they go to click on your profile, if they go to try and search for you and check you out, you know, what are they going to find? What other music are they going to find? You know, what, what other information are they going to be able to kind of dive into um, to become a fan of yours? So, so looking a bit more into kind of the, looking more into the future, we've we've seen a lot in the industry press around um, machine learning, and I guess for you guys at Spotify, you know, Discover Weekly is a is a prime example of a personalized playlist that you know every single Monday generates a thirty track playlist for individuals based on their own personal tastes. Um, how do you how do you see playlist becoming even more personalized in the future um, from from the Spotify perspective? Yeah, I think um, there, there's a number of different ways that we are thinking of, um, you, you know, and that I'm sure every DSP is thinking of uh, and, and outside, but, uh, at, you know, what interests me the most is how can someone interact more on our platform? You know, is it fan to artist? Is it, you know, fan to platform? Um, you know, how can you sort of be a little bit more and more in charge of your listening experience? You know, right now you open the app and you're able to search for anything, you know, browse through a bunch of hubs of playlists. You know, you have the playlist name, obviously, uh, you know, talking about the algorithm is, is a whole is a whole other thing. Um, and that personalization, there's so many avenues, you know, to, to go down, but how can the user, you know, kind of dive in deeper, go through a rabbit hole, um, you know, and again, maybe just be able to more and more influence their listening experience um, so that they can continue to just interact in that way. So is it a more personalized playlist? Is it, you know, a whole variety of different things is it be able you know being able to dive in deeper to like who those artists are um you know yeah so ty um you know we, we, we're talking about kind of automation and, and more machine learning within within curation do you do you think there's still um, a role for human creation in in the future of playlisting where AI and algorithms are even more prevalent in music discovery? Yeah, if humans making music, it's important for humans to curate the music. And once, once it's just machines making music, then maybe that's a different conversation. <laughs> but I don't I don't I don't see um you know I, 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 I don't I'm not a music curator for no platform and I, I would assume that they have a process and they have an art and they passion about how they go around how they go about you know playlisting their music you know all of us at some point in our years growing up listening to music we had our own playlist rather it was on some type of cassette tape or some type of iPod or whatever the case may be and I think though the these particular you know humans that are they're sitting behind the, the the screens or these playlists they have a technique that they are proud of the music that they're curating that they're proud of and it speaks deeper to, to just the song and i don't think that you will ever be able to replace that with a machine <laughs> or an algorithm or whatever you want you know okay. call it I, I completely see your point. Um, uh, Maya, what, uh, from an artist's perspective, you, you obviously have built yourself a very, um, how should I describe it? You've, you're very visible online, right? <laughs> yes, think, very, yeah. <laughs> uh, I've seen you on YouTube, I've watched you on Twitch, I've heard your podcast, you, you know, you, you, you're out there. Um, so, so to what extent do you see artists themselves becoming more influential curators? Uh, in the streaming world and influences and, and as a follow-up like how do you how in what way do you think that the services can support that oh man it's a tough question <laughs> like I, I was nervous to be on this panel because I hope I can have some knowledge to bring to the table but um I don't know I think like just to maybe go off on my own tangent of what that information is but to Lizzie's point earlier of like 
when you're on a playlist like a Lorem or whatever it may be, what's the click through? Like what sort of information are you providing these people with when they find your music and are, you know, drawn to whatever you have? Like even outside of music, like I really focused my time on building who I am online to probably an extreme that not every single person needs to do. Like I'm on basically every single platform known to man, um, which is a little bit a lot. Uh, but I think that, you know, the way that playlists have helped support me as an artist is really maintaining that feeling of no limitations, like being on playlists that really don't define me as a genre, but rather as an artist and, and helping me kind of keep it open-ended and, you know, find those listeners that are willing to listen to music as it evolves as an artist who is hopefully going to continue to push the envelope with her, with her own music and try and try out different things along the way as I continue down my path with it. Um, I think playlists have really helped me find that core group of people that are willing to to stick with me and listen and not leave me just because I'm going to test the waters and something else. Like, I think um, that's been the, the biggest part for me. Mm -hmm. So taking Lorem as an example that you mentioned, I mean, I know that a couple of weeks ago, Billie Eilish curated the Lauren playlist. As an artist, Maya, is that something that, like, as you progress in your career, do you want to work with Spotify or Apple, or whoever, to to curate their, you know, help for a week, for a month, or whatever, to to curate a playlist? Is that something you're interested in, or is that like industry forcing some responsibility over an artist? <laughs> I don't view it like that at all. I think like if as somebody who listens to that playlist, like I think Billy is just such a pivotal part of the core of what that playlist has become that it is a really just interesting way of continuing that interaction where people can, you know, take the fandom to a little bit of a more intense level and, you know, have an artist be in charge of the curation process. Like I think that that is a really cool way to develop upon the playlist idea and continue to support whoever may be on said playlist and bolstering their voice as well. Yeah, because I mean, speak, speaking as a music fan, so much of the music that I discovered when I was younger, or even now, is because artists that I like talked about them or wore a t-shirt or they supported them on a tour or something. So I'm, I'm you know, as I think music fans are interested in what you, what influences you, you know, what makes you mm -hmm. tick. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, we're all gonna geek out if, uh, you know, if Maya says she really loves something, like the relationship that Maya has with her fans, they, they want to know. And, and uh, you know, that's, it's one way for, you know, artists to express themselves. They, artists are spending, they're, they're devoting their life to their craft. So naturally, a lot of them are going to have really good ears when it comes to uh, the type of music they listen to. So, you know, and it, uh, it's, sharing music is such an intimate thing, you know, to Ty's point. Um, I love our Spotify radio feature. I feel confident in it. I can leave it on, um, you know, and it's not going to serve me anything that I'm not going to like. Um, but, you know, if my best friend is into something and shares that with me, that means so much more. Mm. One more question, Maya. Sorry to put you on the spot. No worries. But, um, I on one of your podcast episodes you talked about one of the one of the first tracks that you released called one eight hundred date me and how it was but but like <laughs> but you talked about how it was so clickable you know you you see uh you see you see a song title like that and then you as a, as a fan or as a potential fan you go you click on it right are you very kind of intentional in that when you come up with your song titles that you you want them to be kind of alluring? I think that I was in the beginning a little bit more than I may be now. Like, I think that simplicity is probably where I kind of figure out that's where I want to put my effort into looking at a song title. I definitely don't title every single song. I have 1-800-something now. I like left that chapter behind me. Um, but I think that, you know, when I look at my songs and trying to figure out, you know, what do they look like from a surface level where people are going to want to see what it sounds like. Like I have kept my brand really consistent with things like lowercase and simplifying like language so that way it feels accessible to whoever is looking at my profile. And so um, I think that's kind of where I find myself putting the most amount of effort, just making something that feels very clean and um, 
yeah, I don't know. I think that's the best way to describe it. Mm -hmm. no, it makes perfect sense. Um, Ty, <laughs> you, you obviously advise a lot of artists. How much time as a manager or an advisor do you spend kind of pontificating the, the future of playlists and trying to work out a strategy kind of long term of what the playlisting landscape might look like in a year or five years or is that something yeah. um well it's, it's a good amount of time because i believe that in order to especially in the early stages of an artist's career uh as they're developing their fan base i just think it's important to stay active on the on the platform uh, and being active on the platform is just consistently re releasing music at a pace that is acceptable for fans to kind of keep discovering you and that you can keep building your story through music, uh, creating other ways to utilize Spotify as a platform from playlisting to, you know, sharing, sharing the, uh, the app, just finding ways that as an artist, that you're always opening the app and you're and you're building in that relationship with the platform, no matter if you're just a listener or if you're putting out your music or if you're using you know your playlist or you're pinning your newest release or if you're you know utilizing the artist first aspects of things, whatever whatever it is, I I try to educate the the artist in spending time in investing time into the platform the same that you want the platform to invest that time back into you and it's kind of like a social media approach with how the music is being released uh as if you would look at how instagram you posting photos the more active you're on instagram the more you're going to be in the discovery phase of it and so it's the same way with spotify when it comes to like the radio your weekly discovery all of the algorithm based things that don't have uh curator you know, with a heartbeat, to say the least, uh, can be able to, you, you can still be able to take advantage of that, even if you're not prim primarily getting playlists on bigger playlists, but you may find yourself on personalized playlists, or you may just be building your own personal release radar, your own personal radio channel, where people can just dive into a vibe, and you may be a part of that vibe, that will um, have people discover who you are and what you represent as an artist. So we spend a good amount of time just trying to make sure the artist is spending the time to look how they want to be represented on the platform and to promote that outside of the platform as well. You know, because that's another part of just investing into what I think the future of music is and the future of music is investing into the platform and being active on these platforms that help you discover the music you know it's not like how you used to walk into target and pick up a cd and only cd that you would see is whoever paid the most amount of money to be on the end cap or you already focused on what cd you want to purchase so you go in and you're out this is the first time that we've had the same platform that is selling the music also be the same platform that is helping you discover new music and new artists. So I think it's important for the, the artists to understand how powerful that can be for them if they just invest into that, that, that motto for the next 10 years, 20 years. I think that's a really interesting point that you're raising there in terms of the kind of the democratization of, of music to a much more extent than what it has been historically. And, you know, you see that reflected in in the, the, the increase of independent music that's being consumed and also the kind of wider set of artists that are actually making a living off off music now, which is which is absolutely fantastic. Um, Lizzie, turning to you for a second, um, you've Spotify specifically, you've been very active now during the whole COVID crisis, especially with kind of launching all these different combination playlists. So like you, you've launched the wellness playlist that that includes both music and kind of spoken word, um, soothing spoken word, and also things like the workout playlist where you can also generate playlists based on, you know, the duration of your exercise and how enthusiastic you are about your exercise and your type of exercise. How do you see these combination playlists evolving in the future? Um, 
do you see, do you see yourselves launching much more like developing further on within that space is are you, is it successful so far i think um you know i'm not directly on on the team that's working on those but i love the concept because it is you know again just in the way that you know if you just take a you know a look at how you listen you know when i wake up in the morning i listen to npr then probably snacks daily so i can like check out what's happening you know in stocks even though i don't really do much with it but i find it as kind of like a like a good little like culture update for my day um you know and and a variety of other little uh little podcasts and then i kind of dive into music you know pretty much for the rest of my day so you know whether you're listening that way or you know listening to the radio in your car um it's it's playing around with that listening behavior much like you know going into a pollen or lorem or you know playlists like that you know internet people <laughs> it's it's a uh, it's commenting on you know how you're kind of structuring the way that you listen to things so i love it it's kind of like our first foray into that type of listening you know are you a sports fan okay so should we mix some like kind of sports information into the way that you listen to, to music and, and other things on platform um you know do you want to kind of take a step back and um meditate you know i think those are good it's almost like a good prompt for you know i probably wouldn't take time out of my day to meditate so it's maybe a nice reminder that like hey this listening experience is an option now on spotify um so yeah in that sense i think i think it's a great door opening to what else is out there and i think it would be cool you know in the future to maybe have users get a little bit more uh involved in that you know um i'm not interested in sports and and meditation but i am interested in news and specifically music news so i want the app to kind of like read what i'm into and just automatically mix those things together so that i'm not having to click a bunch of buttons yet i can just open it and it knows me um not in a creepy way but uh in a way that like i can just open it and have the experience i want so that yeah i would hope that that's the way we're moving i think i think with these things any big questions that you have about it the teams making it are probably having those questions too and working to answer them <laughs> that makes <more> sense. <laughs> um unfortunately again we are running out of time a little bit but i would love if we can just go around the group and for all of you guys just to kind of give a little brief thoughts around where you see playlists being uh, where do you think the role of playlists where do you think the role of playlist in curation will be in the next couple of years um maybe starting with Lizzie. yeah no pressure <laughs> <laughs> i know <laughs> um i think you know what i what i want people to take away really is that um none of us have all the answers and we are doing our best to kind of read what's going on what people are looking for and you know i think true innovation comes with you know whatever the biggest roadblock is that we can identify that's where the biggest questions remain um and those are the ones that you know are going to have a lot of reward if they're answered um so yeah i think we are taking it a step at a time uh obviously spotify has invested a lot in our playlist ecosystem and we are trying to evolve and innovate that as much as possible um you know and have it kind of mirror you know who you are as a listener who you are as an artist um you know and really start to take that you know globally and introduce you know there there's so many more listening communities to explore and discover and represent so from my point of view that's something that we are you know really actively trying to pay attention to what about you ty where do you see playlists what, what sort of role do you see playlists playing in music discovery in five ten years time um i think that <clears throat> five ten years time playlisting is going to be uh and it's going to be a huge vehicle for um, even the playing fields for, for creators and artists who 
who's their their ambitions is not to be um a superstar they're they're they just want to make music and have fun making music some some artists don't want to be seen and i think that uh we're going into an era where people want to just make music without all of the the other stresses that come with it and i think that playlisting is going to be able to do that for the independent market for artists and you know and hopefully that can be something that will balance the the overall market in the playing field between the independent creators and the, the major label um artists so that there's more options to be a, a middle class artist and you just are doing what you love you're taking care of your family you know you have fans so obviously you can't get around that part but you don't have to succumb to the stresses of you know, having to be, compete with Beyonce, you know, and, and shit like that. So, yeah, I don't know if I can curse or not, but my bad. <laughs> I love that time. As, some, as somebody that works with independent artists and DIY artists, I fucking love that answer. <laughs> uh, MXM2, Nomaya, where do you- Yeah. I mean, I don't know if I can add too much of that's already been said because I agree completely with both those statements. I think like the way that I look at playlisting, it'll always be a pivotal part of music curation and helping people and audiences find the next artist that they are going to become attached to. And I think to Ty's point, evening the playing field is definitely something that I think about constantly. I didn't think I could do music for a very long time in my life until I, you know, started doing indie songs and stuff because I didn't want to compete with a Beyonce. Like it's just, that's a lot of pressure to take on. And so I think playlisting is, is a wonderful way that it's going to redefine the landscape in terms of helping artists feel like they can make a story for themselves without having to do every single step that we see as a traditional artist pathway. And so, um, I don't know, I think like may maybe my piece of advice is that it is a pivotal part, but it's also a step. And so the work you have to do around it is it's still necessary. And so make sure you you build other aspects of your business, but understand that playlists will still be important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. This has been super, super uh, informative. Uh, if you guys can please stick around and help answer some of the Q&A questions, that would be absolutely amazing because there's quite a few of them. Um, <clears throat> Thank you very much to Lizzie and Ty and MXM Tune, and please go and check out her music because it's amazing. Oh, thank you. Lovely. <laughs> Thanks, Hen, for sharing thank so you. wonderfully well. A great couple of sessions, and again, a big shout out to Spotify for um, helping us out in, uh, in putting those two sessions together. So, on to our next session where I'm going to be handing over to two colleagues of mine. So we are going to be taking you through quite a lot of detail in quite a short period of time, uh, looking at various DSP uh, dashboards and, and comparing and contrasting them, starting up with, with Spotify. So I will hand over um, first to uh, my colleague Kush Patel, and then we'll hear from, from Marlon Welbrook. But let's, uh, let's hear from Kush first. Over to you. Thank you, Paul. Um, I am going to share my screen. Ooh, share the wrong one. Uh, there we go. Um, yeah, so thank you, Paul. Um, so over the next uh, 30 minutes or so, me and Marlon are going to go through um, six of the main DSP dashboards and some of the unique features that each of these platforms offers and how artists can sort of make use of them best. So we're going to look at Spotify for Artists, Apple Music for Artists, Pandora AMP, or Artist Marketing Platform, Amazon Music for Artists, YouTube Studio, um, and then these are backstage. So I'm going to kick off with Spotify for Artists, which is one of the platforms that has been around for the longest time. Um, to access your uh, Spotify Artists account, you can do this by your distributor or you can claim uh, by going to the website and in entering the artist Spot Spotify URL or artist name. Um, you also get instant access if you go through one of Spotify's preferred or recommended distributors. In terms of analytics that Spotify um, for Artists offers, it offers real-time analytics and uh, source of streams as well, meaning that you can understand, you know, where the majority of your streams are coming from. Are they coming from editorial playlists, um, algorithmic playlists, uh, the library, etc. 
Um, you can also see the number of saves, which is unique to Spotify and is a particularly um, useful metric because a save is one of the most powerful indicators of engagement and uh, repeat listening. So the fact that Spotify for us is, offers information on uh, you know, the number of saves uh, makes it a really attractive platform. Um, in terms of some of the key features of Spotify for artists, we have artist playlists, so the ability for artists to create playlists and feature them on their artist profile. We have the artist pick feature, um, which allows you to um, highlight a particular um, you know, piece of merch, a playlist, uh, a new release uh, at the top of the artist Spotify profile. We then have canvases, which are those um, looping videos that will sit behind a playing screen of a uh, particular track. We then have a bunch of branding options. So we have uh, bio, photos, uh, and social links as well. One of the Spotify for Artists' most powerful features is also their playlist pitching tool, which you've just heard uh, lots about um, in the previous sessions. Um, and this allows any artist who has access to Spotify for Artists to pitch to a Spotify editorial playlists. Um, we then have some commerce features. So we have uh, live show and merch integration. So the ability to sell um, these products via your Spotify for Artist uh, profile. Um, and then we have a relatively new feature, which is the donation feature, which I'll talk about a bit about uh, in a second. Overall, we'd say the strength of Spotify for Artists is its wealth of marketing tools and that are developing constantly and enabling artists new ways of connecting with their fans. And uh, Spotify for Artists is available across both desktop and mobile. So I've mentioned the donation feature. This was a feature that was launched at the height of uh, the corona pandemic. Um, and it works just like the regular artist pick, um, but instead of highlighting a release or a playlist, you can highlight a fundraising destination um, in addition to your artist pick. Uh, this can be used to raise money for the artists or their crew, um, but can also be used to raise funds for worthwhile causes um, as part of the approved partner um, program with Spotify's COVID-19 relief effort. Um, so at the moment, some of the fundraising partners include um, platforms like Cash App, GoFundMe and PayPal.me. Um, I mentioned uh, that you are able to uh, pair Spotify, uh, sorry, you are able to create playlists as an artist and pair them with your um, Spotify profile, which is not something that a lot of these DSP dashboards allow you to do but it is a feature that is really useful and allows artists um, you know, to express some of their personality um, and you know, create tastemaker playlists and discography playlists and then assign them to their artist profile. I also mentioned some of those branding features. Spotify uh, for Artists offers one of the widest range of branding features for artists. So you can see there you have the image gallery, you also have the header image, you can include a bio, um, and you also have some of those social links to Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, um, and Wikipedia as well. So lots of branding options available to artists via Spotify for Artists. In terms of commerce features, this is essentially broken down into tickets and merch. Um, ticket, some of their ticketing partners include Songkick, Ticketmaster, Eventbrite, um, AXS, um, and their merch partner is uh, Merch Bar. So you are able to sell um, tickets and merch via your um, Spotify artist profile, which then will direct you to the relevant site to actually go and purchase these goods. Um, so that's really visible on an artist profile as well, um, which is a really nice feature. One feature that um, Spotify announced very relatively recently was virtual events. Um, these are essentially work in a similar way to uh, the normal live show events, but they are for uh, live stream or virtual events. Um, and again, you can uh, use a uh, ticketing, part for ticketing partner like Songkick to feature these on your Spotify artist profile. Um, looking at Spotify Canvas, again, these are those looping videos that you will see sitting behind a, um, a particular track when you're accessing Spotify through the mobile um, app. Um, we also see some really interesting ways of artists looking to incorporate their fans into their Canvas strategy and almost use them as, uh, you know, connecting with them by incorporating them into their canvases. So on the left, on the right there, you can see an example um, from Pentatonic, who actually um, decided to include anyone who had pre-saved their uh, Christmas album in their Spotify canvases as a way of showing, you know, gratitude for their fans going and pre-saving their music. And that was a really nice way of sort of incorporating them into the strategy and making them feel really valued. In terms of some of the key takeaways for um, Spotify for artists, uh, branding is one of the really powerful features that Spotify for artists offers, and we really encourage you to make the most of all available opportunities, whether that's canvases, uh, you know, bio, image gallery, etc. 
in terms of monetization, Spotify also offers um, some really good uh, merch and live show integration um, opportunities. So you can sell uh, merch and tickets via um, your Spotify uh, pro artist profile uh, as a way of capturing some additional revenue. And um, finally, um, in terms of marketing, uh, we have seen some artists, uh, I've mentioned Pentatonix there, who are incorporating their fans into their Canva strategy. And we think this is a really interesting way that artists can look to, uh, you know, connect with their fans in a, in a, new, in a new way and reward them for, um, you know, doing things like pre-saving or purchasing tickets, et cetera. Okay, so on to um, Apple Music for Artists. Um, Apple Music for Artists can be accessed by claiming uh, your profile via, with your Apple ID um, and then entering your iTunes store, store artist link or searching for the artist name. There's then a verification process where you um, validate with your social profiles. Um, in terms of analytics, these are highly customizable in uh, Apple Music for Artists and we'll look, as this, look at this as one of the main benefits. Um, you also get some analytics on the wider Apple ecosystem of products. So you get analytics on Shazam, uh, radio spins by Apple Music Radio, iTunes purchases, um, and also video views because video features um, in Apple, uh, Apple Music. In terms of some of the key features, uh, it does offer highly granular analytics and we'll look at some of the ways you can break down different demographics, different location data in Apple Music for artists and really pinpoint your audience. Um, in terms of branding, there's only really one uh, main option in Apple Music for Artists, and that is to upload an artist image. Uh, but you also do get some nice milestones that um, App Apple Music for Artists will show you when you hit certain streaming or download benchmarks. As I said, one of the major benefits of uh, Apple Music for Artists is that you are able to access highly customizable analytics um, across the Apple ecosystem. So not just Apple Music, but also Shazam, radio, iTunes purchases, etc. It's also accessible via desktop and mobile, but on mobile, it's only for Apple devices, so iOS only. When you go to your Apple Music for Artists homepage, you'll see a quick snapshot of uh, plays, average daily listeners, song purchases, and shazams. And the, in the bottom there, you can also see some of those milestones that have been hit, such as certain songs hit, hitting a certain number of all-time plays um, or you know, hitting a, a benchmark of all-time plays in a particular location. Um, in terms of those highly granular analytics, um, so here is just some of the demographic break breakdowns that you'll see in Apple Music for Artists. So while some other platforms don't allow you to um, you know, set custom dates, uh, Apple Music does allow you to, to do that. So you can set um, custom time periods, number of weeks, number of months, number of years, and see your data within that period. Um, you can also see very granular location-based data, so right down to individual cities. Um, which again, a lot of other platforms don't offer. You then get gender breakdowns and um, age breakdowns as well. And the real benefit of these highly granular, granular analytics is that you can pinpoint exactly where your most uh, you know, loyal and engaged audience is, and then maybe look to um, target those areas with marketing in the future. And just to hit home how granular the analytics are in um, uh, Apple Music for Artists. Here's the screenshot from our artist that we manage, Ruben Daunton, and we can see that Ruben Daunton within uh, this period had had two plays in Panama. Obviously, that's just one city, um, and we can see exactly how many um, streams he has had in that particular location, which is, um, like I said, really, really uh, useful. In terms of the branding, the only real piece of branding you are able to control on your Apple Music for, uh, profile is the artist image. Um, and uh, yeah, these are uploaded in uh, images that are 800 by 800 pixels. So some key takeaways for um, Apple Music for Artists is that the analytics are really powerful and allow you to pinpoint exactly where your audience are and also analyze the impact of your marketing efforts on streams and downloads. Um, in terms of identifying new markets, those integrated metrics from Shazam and Apple Music Radio can help you to identify where there is buzz in a particular territory and again, amplify your marketing messages in those locations to hopefully grow the artists in those regions. And in terms of limitations, um, the profile customizability is quite limited and there is no integrated playlist pitching tool like you'll see with um, Spotify, for example. Okay, and on to uh, my final platform before I move on to uh, uh, Marlin's section. 
Um, so Pandora, uh, for those of you who may not know, is uh, one of the biggest streaming services in the US with over 60 million monthly active users. And that's why we've included it um, in this uh, presentation, as it is still one of the most important platforms in that um, region. It's pre predominantly a radio focused streaming service and it's owned by American broadcasting company Sirius XM. In terms of access, you will need a Pandora account. Um, to get a Pandora account, you have to be uh, based in the US or use a VPN to access and set up a Pandora account in the US. And then once you've signed, once you've created a Pandora account, you can sign the Pandora AMP, which stands for Artist Marketing Platform, and access all the analytics and uh, marketing tools via that platform. Um, in terms of analytics, some of the unique analytics it offers that are particularly useful are station ads. So you can see the number of times your uh, track has been added to a particular station. As I mentioned, Pandora is a radio focused streaming service. So those station ads are one of the most important metrics. You can also see thumbs up. Um, so in Pandora, when a particular user thumbs up a track, that means they're going to see that track in more of the radio stations they're listening to. So again, it's a good uh, measure of engagement and to see um, how likely that track is to be served to more um, uh, radio stations in the future and kind of an indication of how likely that track is to be popular. In terms of key features, you can upload an artist image. Um, Pandora also has an integrated playlist pitching tool. Um, it has analytics integration with Next Big Sound, which is actually a platform that Pandora brought out a few years ago. Um, it also has some free promotional tools, which we'll look at in more detail, which are the artist message, featured track, and the promote single and show options. In terms of its major strengths, it is its marketing tools, um, which are those four I've just mentioned, as well as the ability to submit um, playlist submissions uh, to um, the radio stations that are uh, yeah, being curated on Pandora. Um, and in terms of uh, how you can access it, you can access it through desktop and also mobile, but mobile is US only. So let's kick off with um, the, uh, the uh, integration with Next Big Sound. So this Next Big Sound is actually the only place you can get in-depth analytics on your Pandora performance. Um, so particularly if you're an artist or you're working with an artist based in the US, uh, this can be particularly useful. Um, it also has integrated Twitter and Facebook data, but it is unfortunately missing Instagram, which is one of the drawbacks of uh, this integration with Next Big Sound. But it is the only place you can access uh, detailed Pandora um, analytics. I mentioned the submissions tool. Uh, this is similar to the uh, Spotify artist submissions tool, where you can pitch your songs to Pandora's team. Um, Pandora use um, quite a sophisticated approach to curate their playlist and their data science team will actually listen to the submissions and then put them into the uh, music genome project where the track is analyzed and then it's determined where that song might best be placed so uh, yeah it's, it's an interesting proprietary piece of um, uh, an algorithm they have there uh, which helps to pitch the sorry which helps to place these um, tracks in players which uh, uh, their team think it would be particularly um, valued in terms of those free promotional tools, I mentioned four. Um, the first was the artist message, where you could connect with your fans uh, by creating a brief audio message that would uh, launch before your, your Pandora station plays. Uh, you also have a feature track where you have the opportunity to feature a track for eight weeks, uh, which will ac accelerate the feedback and discovery of one of your songs. So this is only av available to tracks which have received 10 spins per week, have been released in the past year, and have not been featured before um, as, as a featured track. We then have uh, the two final options there, which are to promote singles and to promote shows. And again, this is um, allows artists to record a message in order to promote um, upcoming singles or shows. Um, and you can also bundle several different elements of, this, of, of these promotional tools into one campaign where you can see analytics across these um, different uh, promotional tools. And finally, before we look at some key takeaways, uh, I want to mention Pandora Story. So this is a feature that uh, Pandora launched in early 2019 and basically allows artists and other creators to add commentary to their playlist, similar to the um, uh, playlist that we've seen from some of the bigger artists in Spotify recently. So acts like 2 chains have started to leverage this feature, giving them the chance to share um, the meaning and inspiration that's behind their songs. Um, and yeah, just provide more context around their music when they are um, you know, creating these players and hopefully enable them to connect more strongly with their fan base. 
So to finish off with some key takeaways, uh, we've mentioned those analytics and the integration with Next Big Sound, and that this is really the only place you can see detailed analytics on your uh, Pandora performance. In terms of discovery, there are a range of free promotional tools that can help drive this. So we looked at uh, those artist messages, as well as the feature track options, which can help to serve your music out to a wider audience. In terms of engagement, um, we can look to connect fans with Pandora stories. So just providing a bit more context around the music um, and hopefully being uh, able to connect more strongly with the fans when we launch a new album. And just want to mention one thing that uh, Pandora are looking to in the future which is that they are testing interactive voice ads, meaning that um, people will be able to interact with their smart speaker, for example. Uh, the ad will ask them a question, they'll be able to give an answer, and the ad will be responsive in that way. Um, this could be a really interesting way of uh, yeah, advertising and sort of engaging people more with advertising on the platform. So yeah, definitely one to look out for. Um, and I think that's it for me, and I will uh, hand over to Marlon, who will tell you about Amazon Music for Artists. Exactly, one second. Yes, um, so I'm going to continue with Amazon Music for Artists, which is Amazon's uh, own artist backend. And they've launched this earlier this year with expedited access for artists using CD Baby or DistroKid for distribution. Um, if you're a signed artist, you will need to get in touch with the labor relations contact at Amazon and you will then get access to this additional data, which is also complementing the analytics that you're already receiving from Amazon. Um, the analytics are customizable in terms of the time frame. They are also in real time, so that means they're updating every couple of minutes. But two of the most innovative analytical features are insights into the number of fans and super fans an artist has on the platform, as well as voice analytics. And we're going to look at that just in a minute. Um, however, there are currently no insights into audience demographics. Some other key features include Amazon Music's recently launched Twitch integration as well as their lyrics matching feature, uh, which is powered by Lyric Find and Music Match. And that means that you can actually see synchronized lyrics on the app, but users will also be able to request songs via parts of the lyrics. And yeah, we think that the strength of Amazon Music for Artists is that it's benefiting from the overall Amazon ecosystem, where it integrates voice, Twitch, and e-commerce. And the um, Amazon Music for Artists app, or backend, is available on both desktop and mobile. So as mentioned, um, there's a fans tab inside Amazon Music for Artists showing the overall listener number for the artist, but then also breaking it down into fans and super fans. And this is quite revolutionary as it helps artist managers and labels to understand the quality of a stream and to see how engaged the listeners on the platform really are. Um, so Amazon takes into account here factors such as how often the fans listen to the artist compared to other listeners, how long they listen for, if they save the music to their playlist and library, um, whether or not they follow the artist on Amazon Music or via Alexa, um, or also if they purchase something from the artist on the Amazon store. The voice tab provides data for the amount of requests and requesters accessing the artist's music via voice command, so um, by Amazon's market-leading smart speakers or other Alexa-enabled devices. And that means people who have explicitly asked Alexa to play that specific artist, a specific album, a specific song, or who have requested via lyrics. Um, and you will get this data broken down by request category. You can see in the screenshot here as well that there is a daily voice index that compares the volume of voice requests of the artist um, compared to other artists of similar popularity on Amazon Music. And this scale moves from cold to warm to hot to on fire. And again, this is the first time we can see um, some insights into how music fans are interacting with voice. Then since the beginning of September, artists can now link their Twitch channel with their Amazon Music profile within the Amazon Music for Artists app so that their live streams appear on their profile on Amazon Music. And this means that fans can now go straight from a live stream to listening to the artist's music, and they don't need to change the platform for that. So that's obviously a huge promotional vehicle and also a direct driver of streams and consumption. And it's the first time that, an, that any artist has the opportunity to directly talk to their audience within a DSP. And to drive discovery for these live streams, Amazon Music um, features a carousel on their homepage where they promote artist live streams. They also have a new live tab, um, which will list all of the performances happening currently in real time. And followers of the artist will receive push notifications when the artist they follow goes live. 
Also notable is Amazon's merchandise offering, where artists can choose to make their existing merch available on Amazon, either self-fulfilled or shipped to an Amazon fulfillment center, or they also have the opportunity to do this completely on um, print on demand, uh, which is a super flexible solution. And the key takeaways when looking at Amazon Music for Artists is, um, I would say that by looking at an artist's voice and fan analytics, we can really get some actionable insights how to help drive growth um, on voice and on Amazon Music. Um, so artists can, for example, launch voice-focused campaigns where they educate their fans to request their music via voice, um, but also reminding fans to follow on Amazon, making merch available, and more generally trying to encourage all of these actions that drive fan growth and voice growth, as this will ultimately benefit uh, the success of the artist overall on Amazon. And with live streaming, it's also worth remembering that Twitch offers affiliate status from 5,000 fans on, um, at which point live streaming on Twitch can become an additional revenue stream. It's, it's not currently enabled on Amazon Music yet, but it's still a very, very fresh partnership. So um, who knows if that might be added in the future. And yeah, when we think about some of the features that could further enhance Amazon Music's artist tool, um, besides profile optimization features, it will also be great maybe to see something uh, where artists will be able to reach out to their fans and super fans um, and give them something of value, um, seeing that Amazon already makes this uh, differentiation. Um, or maybe even adding in uh, data around physical sales and merge data so that you have all of this data within one app. But yeah, it's still um, kind of the first version of this app, so I'm sure there's still a lot to come for Amazon Music for Artists. Next up is YouTube's backend for artists, which can be accessed via YouTube Studio. And here we will look specifically at the features available to official artist channels on YouTube, especially because YouTube has re recently launched um, the new YouTube's, YouTube analytics for artists, which are available inside official artist channels only. So in order, first of all, to get an official artist channel, you will need to own and operate an artist channel and you will need to have at least three official releases delivered to YouTube by a partner such as a label or distributor. Um, the analytics of YouTube are very robust and highly customizable. And then this summer, they finally released analytics that are specifically designed for artists. And these will now cover an artist's content and music across the whole YouTube ecosystem. And they are also in real time. Uh, official artist channels will get an artist specific profile that will also be used across other Google properties such as YouTube Music. We now have a total reach feature, many social features that are available on YouTube overall, such as the community tab and commenting with, uh, yeah, and just talking with uh, fans on the platform, as well as the ability to sell merch and tickets via YouTube. And we see the strength of YouTube in how it adds UGC into the mix and also in the high level of customizability when it comes to artist channels and uploads, for example, with subtitles and descriptions. And YouTube Studio and YouTube Analytics for Artists are also accessible both on desktop and mobile. Um, yeah, to just quickly recap, YouTube launched official artist channels, which are also called OACs in 2018, because they wanted to create one official destination grouping all of an artist's content. Um, whereas pre previously you would have had an artist owned and operated channel, their Vivo channel and their auto-generated topic channel split. Um, so you had split views and also split analytics. Um, so yeah, with the launch of the OACs, um, YouTube is now more akin to other DSPs, um, making it yeah, easier for listeners to find an artist's official releases and albums uh, on one channel. And it also provides a more holistic view of an artist's performance across YouTube as it combines these insights into consumption across all of those channels. You can then jump into the profile section here on the left, um, where you can upload an image gallery and an artist's bio. And these will also be featured on YouTube Music. So the only way to take control over your presence on YouTube Music is by having an official artist channel. Now, um, YouTube's analytics have been around for a long time, but these were more geared towards creators. And some of these insights were not directly relevant for artists. The new YouTube analytics for artists are now taking into account these specifics of an artist on the platform. And you can see here that there's a new total reach feature that not only shows how users are engaging with the content on the artist channel, but also on third party channels, such as curator brands, but also UGC. 
And in the top right, right corner, you can see that you can decide whether you want to look at the analytics overall, just for the OIC or just for third party channels. And um, but most importantly, these views generated by these other channels now contribute to an artist's views and watch time on their official artist channel. YouTube also offers a growing number of additional monetization features for artists. Um, so previously selling merch on your YouTube channel was only possible if you were part of the YouTube partner program. And now with official artist channels, you can also sell merch under your videos via YouTube's partnership with Merch Club. Uh, and a feature that has also recently been opened up for artists that are part of this partner program uh, are Super Chat and Super Stickers, where viewers can purchase highlighted chats and animated images um, that they can use to stand out in the chat during live streams and premieres. So quite similar to what users can do on Twitch. And YouTube's ticketing feature, which was um, US only for a long time, has opened up to a few additional uh, countries some months ago. So we're really hoping that this is going to roll out more globally soon as well. Yeah, so YouTube says that the top 1000 artists on YouTube get over 20% of their chart eligible views from videos created by users. So UGC is really a tool for growth and discovery on YouTube um, and should therefore be encouraged, for example, by interacting with UGC content, um, by commenting, liking, creating playlists with um, UGC videos you like, reaching out to influencers or running UGC focused campaigns, are also making an artist's music available on a service like Lict, for example. Um, as the physical live market is non-existent at the moment and live streaming has taken center stage, artists could also be making more money uh, with their live streams by incorporating things um, like the ones I've mentioned, um, exclusive merch drops under their videos, enabling super chat and super stickers, and just thinking more holistically around a video and live stream launch and what they can add onto it. Um, we didn't get too much into detail about all of the optimization opportunities on YouTube, but the platform provides us with a lot of control in terms of presenting content and also making it more discoverable. So uh, yeah, we should make sure to make use of things like custom thumbnails, descriptions, tags, subtitles, playlists, um, cards and end screens and uh, all of the other features that are there. And there's also a new upcoming feature that's currently in beta where you can schedule a premiere of a new video, uh, but you also do a live stream beforehand. So for example, a Q&A with fans. So this gives us really even more engagement opportunities around premieres. And yeah, finally, um, a look at Deezer Backstage. Deezer Backstage has a landing page that you can request access on. Um, however, it might take um, a couple of days until you get in as the team works through the requests. The analytics are also customizable in terms of the time frame, and you can see where fans are listening as well as on which devices. You get some data on the, um, the artist fan evolution, and you can easily compare unique listeners versus total streams. But the most innovative insight here um, is being able to see how many streams were ad supported and how many were premium driven. Uh, the key features for artists within Deezer Backstage are definitely the profile optimization features, I would say, um, because they can upload artist bios in multiple languages and there are some other additional social features as well. Um, Deezer's strategy has always been uh, to be a local hero amongst the DSPs, so they've always been focusing a lot uh, on offering these um, localization um, aspects um, for every region. And this is clearly also um, their strength and focus when it comes to artist features at the moment. Um, and when it comes to Deezer Backstage, um, as it's still a quite new tool, it is currently only available for desktop uh, and there's no mobile app at the moment. So um, just to quickly show you this, here you can see um, where, uh, where you can choose um, if you want to look into overall analytics or to differentiate between ad supported users and premium streams. Um, and this is can, yeah, this can be helpful to understand the revenue flowing in from Deezer. You have complete control over the artist profile, so you can directly upload a profile image. You can link to Facebook and Twitter, so to grow your other digital channels as well. And you can also publish a status update. As mentioned, you can upload artist bios in multiple languages. Um, and yeah, this can really be incredibly important to be able to resonate and communicate more effectively with global fan bases. So it's definitely something that artists should do for their priority territories. And it's something that no other DSP currently offers besides maybe YouTube with their translated descriptions. 
It's also very interesting to be able to compare streams versus unique listeners um, to see whether an artist has a small fan base that streams quite excessively or maybe rather a large number of people streaming less often. So you can really um, identify how passionate the listeners of the artists are um, and yeah, how lean forward what their listening is, which is also something that's quite important uh, for a DSP like Deezer to really identify which artists they want to provide with further support on the platform. And I think in terms of the current functionalities on Deezer Backstage, um, especially as a lot of focus is often placed on bigger DSPs, we should really think about how to best grow our fans on Deezer. And Deezer Backstage provides us with um, yeah, these insights into our fan evolution. So we should think about what can we do with this. We can create localized bios, we can engage the listener with social updates, uh, and also think about how to drive user playlist additions on the platform. But there are also a lot of updates to come to the platform. Deezer is currently working on a fan algorithm, which is perhaps comparable to Amazon's fan analytics, but specifically trying to identify the likelihood of the listener buying a ticket to a show and to really create this hierarchy of where an artist's biggest fans are. Uh, and another very exciting feature Deezer is working on is what it calls stream activity. So uh, this will show at which point in the song fans have liked it, skipped it or completely banned it. Um, so this is really, really important for artists to understand um, what resonates with their audience, where they might be losing fans. Um, so it's almost like a little A&R feedback for them. And on top of that, um, the team is also working. Oh, and... Yep. <laughs> Almost done. Um, oh, sorry. I didn't, I didn't realize it was all on the <laughs> some, yeah. yeah, the team is also working on some additional artist marketing features um, like real time release data and pinning an artist discography to the artist profile. And I'm done, Paul. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. I was just getting panicky about the last panel. So, um, thanks very much to Marlin. Thanks very much to Kush. And uh, thanks to Ruben Dawson, by the way, for sharing his, uh, allowing us to share his data um, in that session. And do please note that uh, with, uh, with Deezer, we're going to have a special TV show next, uh, next Wednesday. Um, when they are going to be revealing some exclusive data about their user-centric licensing, which uh, which should be very uh, very interesting too. Um, and uh, now we oh yes, and do please check out our learning hub, learn.musicali.com. I'll tell you more about that tomorrow, um, and uh, we'll be having a special offer to everyone um, to uh, give you some free access to sample that and uh, hopefully enjoy a lot more of our learning content. We've got uh, video content and all sorts of different modules in there. Uh, but now I'm going to be handing over to Mike Jabara from MQA. Uh, again, thanks uh, Mike for supporting uh, the event. Uh, and uh, this is a, a, a topic that I think is really important because it's looking at how do DSPs uh, innovate and differentiate their services from one another, one of which may well be using high quality audio like MQA. But I'll hand over to Mike to uh, introduce the panel. Over to you, Mike. Thank you, Paul. <clears throat> I'll, uh, I'm watching all of the frames go in and out. There we go. And uh, I'll start by saying thanks to uh, the great three individuals joining. So um, I'll start with Cheryl Allen, Angel Gambino, and Arun Sajan. Thanks, everybody, for joining. I'm looking for Arun. OK, I see his frame up there. Um, Cheryl's joining us from the Pandora side of the SiriusXM Pandora House, angel, uh, investor, serial entrepreneur. I think your most recent working stiff job, Angel, was uh, chief commercial officer at Napster, um, up to a lot of interesting things. And Arun, who is currently uh, part of Angami, heading up the licensing side of it, also has a, a mixed back background. I think you even have some Sony uh, history in your CV somewhere there. I'm particularly excited about Arun's joining uh, as an ethnically Lebanese American, I've been fascinated by Angami and hope to learn more about uh, what's going on in the Arab world and entertainment in that space. So really exciting group. As all of you uh, would have seen from the agenda, um, we're going to talk for a little while about differentiation and innovation in uh, streaming services. That means we get a chance to talk about um, some great ideas happening in different markets around the world, as well as a little bit of what's next. And we're going to be following the structure, but all the panelists know to jump in on any of the topics as they see fit or if they have thoughts they want to chime in on. So we're going to leave ourselves 
open, our mics open, and, and just go at it. Um, as a way of getting us started, Cheryl, if you don't mind, would you mind speaking for a minute about Pandora and SiriusXM and uh, a company who's really defined the category and therefore is almost uh, been defining the leading edge? Would you mind talking about the stuff to the extent that you can, you're all thinking about now or what's next coming out of the, the Pandora Sirius world? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, so one of the things that we're really excited about since Sirius X XM had acquired Pandora is that Sirius XM has access to sort of all of this really exciting, fresh studio content that comes in on a regular basis. And those types of um, experiences, I think mixed, uh, potentially mixed with Pandora's genome is really exciting to us. Um, Pandora, for those of you that might not know, is really um, known in the US for um, having a sort of state-of-the-art uh, music genome that does radio play. And the idea of being able to combine that music genome, not just for music, but also thinking about it for podcasts and mixing it with some of those live experiences, news, sports, gossip, et cetera, um, is really sort of where we, you know, where we see the future, so. Excellent, thank you. Um, Angel, I'm gonna turn to you next. I know you tend to sit in the seat as a consumer when you're thinking about what you wanna work on next. Um, what's got your attention right now? What are some of the things that we should be aware of that you've been watching probably for six to 12 to 18 months? So um, I've been listening more than uh, observing um, and uh, in the context of, you know, unlike many consumers, my streaming consumption has, you know, shot up radically. And I think, you know, and, and I've got access to all the DSPs for the most part. And I think, you know, one of the things that I'm struck by from a consumer standpoint is that there isn't so much differentiation between the streaming services from an experiential standpoint. So I think, you know, one of the things that, you know, that needs to happen and kind of the, the purpose of this discussion is looking at you know, not just expanding into other genres of programming, i.e., you know, podcasts, but what um, can the DSPs and the wider ecosystem of, you know, of startups, of, you know, people who are working in music tech, you know, on a daily basis, what can we do um, from a kind of product and service and experiential standpoint to help take, you know, playlisting and discovery to the next stage. You know, I found myself either, you know, playing a lot of Pandora radio stations. I actually found some really good ones on, you know, on Spotify. Um, and, you know, but then I was defaulting to a lot of my standard playlists, you know, over this period of time. And so I think, you know, one of the things that, uh, that we can all do together is start to, you know, potentially look at ways that we can make it easier for DSPs to partner with startups. Because I think that, you know, a lot of the DSPs have become kind of like the big labels or big media companies in, in the challenge that, that innovators and creators have in engaging like a lot of artists know how difficult it can be to get into a playlist well it's it's very similar for you know for people who are developing new applications which can actually help drive you know participation and consumption and you know right now i'm on uh the board of directors of a company called audible reality and they have created something called vibes which is you know essentially you know, what Instagram does for, you know, filters and photos and allows you to personalize images, uh, they allow you to do that for music tracks. So, and what we're seeing is that, um, you know, that fans and super fans are listening to um, a song over and over and over because they have different ways to hear it, different ways to experience it. So I think that there's a lot of room for us to create new experiences that will drive streaming consumption and right now that's really important because artists don't have you know these other income streams like touring etc so 
you know, they're more reliant on streaming consumption. So I think, you know, together we really need to make it easier for us to partner together so we can create new experiences that help drive uh, new discovery, that help drive new kind of consumption behaviors. That's great. And I'm going to come back to it because I think that's a central theme to this panel. Um, I'm going to zoom out a little bit. Arun, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask you to do two things. One is because our listener viewers may not be as familiar um, with Angami, would you spend just a minute talking about Angami and then talk about some of the things in your day to day in the service that actually might be unique in other markets, but they're commonplace or standard for Angami as a way of kind of coming back to Angel's point? As sure. Well. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, so Angami, uh, for those who don't know about uh, what it is, uh, we are the biggest uh, music streaming service in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, we uh, basically service, you know, music from all the way, starting from Oman, all the way to uh, uh, Morocco. So that's a pretty, uh, you know, big region where uh, predominantly everyone speaks Arabic. Um, so we started in 2012. Um, uh, we got a head start back then. There was not a lot of uh, uh, streaming or music services in the Middle East. So we kind of, you know, had that uh, uh, head start back then. But, you know, over the years, we've gone on to become the biggest uh, streaming service in the region. Uh, coming back to, uh, you know, your topic of, you know, what we've been doing off late, uh, especially in the last seven, eight months since uh, um, pretty much the whole world uh, went on a lockdown. Uh, we started, you know, realizing that the, the like um, Angel uh, pointed out that, you know, they had to be some differentiation, right? Um, so what we started uh, looking at was how we could, you know, how could we be different from from the other services that are uh, available in this market. So we, we actually went about doing, you know, we, we were the first ones to actually start uh, live streaming. So we, uh, you know, got a bunch of artists. Uh, first, we started uh, on the social media uh, handles, wherein uh, Angrami, uh, on Angrami's Instagram channel, the different artists would come and, you know, perform live uh, uh, gigs. This, we started right back in March, I think. Um, the latest thing that we've done uh, now uh, as a differentiator, we've actually started a live radio feature, which essentially means that um, we don't we don't have live radio channels, but we actually let the users become uh, radio personalities. So what they can do is that they can actually get their friends on the uh, on the platform to actually join him on his radio session. So he can be a DJ, uh, a disc jock, and then people can uh, you know follow him, and then he can become his own little you know. A radio personality. So uh, it's a very interesting thing that we've done there. It's a, specifically because there are super influencers uh, and we want the users to become those influencers rather than, uh, you know, just relying on the, uh, on, on, on our curators or AI for playlist, uh, you know, taste making or even the artists uh, for that matter. So every user is basically a taste, a taste maker now. So, you know, pretty cool things that we've, we've done off late. And what are the different ways that you monetize your consumers and users around how should we think about the revenue mix <clears throat> um okay so so uh, uh, middle east poses its own unique challenges um uh, on the positive side we are uh, we are a pretty uh, mobile uh, you know savvy uh, region so uh, in some countries we've got almost 200 uh, percent mobile penetration i.e you know one user could have two mobile phones uh on an average, uh, but on the other hand, we also see that um, you know credit card uh, acceptance is not so high in the Middle East. So uh, what we did as a differentiator was that we actually went about uh, right when we started, uh, we went about doing all the mobile uh, telco uh, you know bundling deals. So uh, now, if you're in the region, uh, if whatever network you're on, you will pretty much always find a you know um, telco bundle to go with. I mean, if you have a data plan, you'll find Anrami on it, you know, through, through some kind of a bundle. Um, so um, our, our mix in terms of, you know, how we monetize the customers, uh, most of them, because there is a less uh, credit card acceptance, most of them are uh, on advertising uh, based solution, which is a freemium uh, tier. Uh, you may not have all the features as such as that you get on a on-demand, you know, premium uh, packs, but uh, more, most of the users are on that, but we also have a premium pack and then we've got a, you know, a bunch of different uh, telco deals that we've got. So you can be on, do for example, in UAE and you, you would uh, get a hundred dirham data pack and you get on Rami free with it, you know, stuff like that. So, 
Thank you. The reason I was interested in that in um, is because, and I don't want to give away my age by my example here, but in early days of digital, the concept of value was, and price per kind of content, almost music by the pound value, was a way that some of the early new experiences were created. Can I get three bonus tracks for the cost of one extra, right? There are premium Apple experiences that we're all part of. So I wanted all three of you in any order to weigh in on where does that value proposition play in the consumer's mindset when it comes to introducing new experiences? And is it, it still matters or are, are these the early days such that if the experience is exceptional, the price of it is secondary to a consumer? Can you give some input on that? Maybe Cheryl, you want to start us on that? Sure. I mean, from my perspective, the 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 cost of I I do think value is important, um, but um, we've definitely gone in a direction in my mind where um, you know essentially paying you know sort of twelve. Twelve ninety nine a month for access to all of music in the world is uh, is uh, quite a value, I would say. Um, you know, right offhand. Um, so I do think that where we're looking now is around differentiation in experience. Um, I do think that's where consumers are looking um, now uh, because from a you know mu music from from a uh, I do think that music and podcasts have become in some ways a little too commoditized and that we need to actually kind of move a little bit more into this direction of um, extending those new experiences. Um, I also think that from an audio standpoint that consumers are using audio in different ways. Um, I, know, uh, I know from my experiences that the uh, with my own family that using smart speakers, for example, is um, it's not just used to sort of like play music or um, play the latest um, podcast, but it's also being used to sort of augment our conversation. And um, so when we're talking about what happened that day, being able to bring up sort of the latest news clip or being able to talk a little bit more about sort of what was shared with you recently and then um, kind of use your smart speaker as your own personal sort of bibliography, I think is um, just for example, one of those ways in which sort of like your, your natural everyday life experiences start overlapping with what's accessible from a music standpoint. I'm, I'm sure there's thousands of examples, but, um, but I do think that that's what's being looked for. You know, I think, Mike, on the pricing front, I think, you know, most of us who have worked at DSPs um, or worked closely with DSPs know how extremely tight the margins are at the current price point. So a lot of this innovation that we're talking about is difficult because it requires resources, it requires people and technologies to create these differentiated experiences. And when the margins are so tight, it's very difficult to do so. But, you know, but what, we're, what we've also seen is, you know, with people more and more, you know, moving to streaming services across the board, you know, even, you know, Netflix or meditation, you know, with Headspace or Calm or 10% or whatever, um, you know, people are getting to that point of like, well, wait a minute, you know, I was trying to ditch my cable bill or whatever, to be able to save some money and go over the top of these services. And now when I look at, you know, what I'm paying across all these services, I'm actually paying more in some cases. So I think, you know, it's going to be tough on the pricing front to try to find ways to increase um, prices, even when you're adding a lot more value and a lot more, you know, experiences or, or a lot more, you know, content, whether that's music or, or other types of programming. I think it's tough, but then, it also depends, you know, on the demographic, right? Because, you know, we did loads of fo focus groups, you know, I've done loads of focus groups, you know, for the past 20 years in streaming. And, you know, what you'll find is, you know, there are certain, you know, for example, you know, the last panel I did, which was last year, so before the pandemic, uh, and I'm sure the pandemic has, has impacted people's, you know, uh, propensity to pay or ability to pay, but, you know, but college age, you know, uh, both female and male, 
you know, we're willing to pay oftentimes a premium. So, you know, not, not just sticking to a kind of free service, they were willing to pay a premium, but, you know, but they definitely had caps on what they were willing to pay. So they, you know, if you talked about price increases, they're like, no, then I'll go free because, you know, they have less ability to pay. So I think, you know, I think it's tough to look at, you know, pricing as uh, across the board, but I do think that there is a potential to create more of these value add bundles and, uh, and price them for different segments of the market. But, but there are definitely more and more people, especially right now, who are price conscious, but we have to recognize that if we can't raise the prices and the margins aren't changing anytime soon, then it's also going to be hard to continue to invest in these new differentiated services or, or innovation on the whole. Great point. You know, it's yeah. interesting how we're living. Um, I'll, go ahead, Arun. I didn't mean to step no, on what you're saying. Go ahead. No, absolutely. I mean, I, I agree with Angel's point. I mean, but also, you know, the fact that uh, uh, most, uh, like, we would, we would love to create more packages and, you know, more bundles and stuff. Uh, but also keeping in mind that, you know, we are actually kind of dictated by the major labels in terms of what we can do and we can't do. And there's a lot of, you know, uh, times where we're kind of stuck. We like, you know, for example, in the Middle East, you would see uh, a, a massive differentiation in terms of, you know, what, uh, what people can pay in UAE, for example, because the ARPUs are pretty much higher. It's a, you know, a rich uh, country. Uh, but you also have, on the other hand, Egypt, where your actual ARPU is $2 uh, per month, which is nothing. So you can't expect the same, uh, you know, benchmark to be applied in Egypt that you apply in UAE. Uh, and then we also have to deal with the labels dictating that you cannot, you know, price your product below a certain level. And then uh, no matter how much innovation we want to, uh, you know, bring in, well, we're always kind of, you know, sometimes stifled by the, uh, by, the, by the dictation of the labels. But, you know, that's the world we live in. So you got to live by well, it. <laughs> you had mentioned, Arun, earlier, um, the live content that you've been involved with. It, this might sound surprising, um, and I'm not here to talk too much about MQA, but for the broader group, we're an audio technology company and act really as an ingredient technology inside of DSP platforms and, and content and copyright companies. But we launched our live technology in March of 2018, which now that seems like decades ago, right? I'm expecting that the live music business would see it as an opportunity to reach fans who couldn't get to venues. And at the time, of course, nobody was envisioning where we're, what we're all living through, but was just, hey, not every tour goes through every city. Not every tour starts in the same cities. Fans are not always aligned. How do we reach out to them? Um, we didn't necessarily get the uptake at the time of the live promoters, but the OTT world picked up on it immediately because they saw it as an opportunity to immediately upgrade audio inside of video experiences. And the markets had been talking about four, eight, you know, all the K increments of video, and we hadn't told the story around audio for some time. Right. Um, to think that necessity, I'll say, is what opened the mass market up to live entertainment and live music and live streaming gives us in some strange way another lever rather than just price to drive behavior change, which is how do you create that perception of need or or make it so pursued or so cool or whatever it might be that people say i have to be doing it i think one of those examples is how consumers have become creators on many platforms that are becoming very important right that unlocks the traditional constraints that you're Absolutely. referring to arun about licensing content from major companies yeah. right no we, we were actually thinking of uh, you know launching the live anyways before before the pandemic and then the pandemic happened and we were like, you know, uh, artists want to do it now, the users want it, and it's absolutely the best time. Uh, it, you know, it, it was the right time for us to do it anyways. But before that, we were actually skeptical because we were like, you know, how are you going to get the bigger artists? They're going to obviously, you know, charge us the bomb um, and whatnot. But then eventually it all fell together and, you know, unfortunately in a bad way, but <laughs> yeah. Um, but it did. And then sometimes, um, Angel, back to your point about DSP startup collaboration. It's interesting because often the easiest artists to work with are not as well known. And so sometimes you might be showing off the experience before necessarily attracting a two or three million consumer fan base. What are, are there examples that you're looking at or thinking about in terms of experiences that would come from those types of collaborations? 
Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so one of the big projects uh, that we were working on as a venture studio with a major spirits brand was specifically looking uh, at how do you, um, first of all, create greater transparency around uh, venues who are already playing music, whether that's a bar or a restaurant or whatever, to be able to kind of broadcast out what the vibe is of any particular venue at, at any particular moment, right? And so, uh, and there are lots of different aspects to that too. You know, there, there are companies like Soundtrack Your Brand and, and things like that where, you know, where you have these in-venue uh, um, streaming services but they're still not tied into point of sale, for example. So you don't really know, are you, you know, you're making guesses around, is there any relationship between the music that you're playing and your alcohol sales? Like, you know, there are lots of interesting areas um, that, you know, that I've been focused on and, and, and lots of opportunities for new services. And I think, you know, in those, um, you know, for those, uh, one of the things that, you know, that, I think is kind of, you know, disappointing, kind of going to Arun's point and, and also to your question, Mike, is that, you know, the labels have these uh, embryonic digital innovation licenses and they call them different things at the different labels, but, you know, but they haven't really gone anywhere and they're complicated because then you also have to, you know, get the publishers on board and, and et cetera. But, you know, but I think that there is a room for a SoundCloud or even a BBC or some new startups to say, hey, we're going to start, you know, from scratch. And these are the licensing terms, you know, up until an app gets a certain amount of consumption, right? Um, so, for example, any artist can, you know, can come on board, um, but it's going to be basically free until we hit a certain number of streams. Then once we hit a certain number of streams, you know, then it's going to trigger a whole new, you know, commercial model where people have to, you know, pay for access, whether that's transactional through virtual items, through subscription. Um, I think we, we need to create um, more of a sandbox, <laughs> um, if you will, you know, for the both the creators, you know, the, whether that's, you know, musicians um, or other creators, users who want to create new mixes. Um, and we have to make it easier for them to be able to, you know, at least get up to a stage to see whether or not there's any demand for these things, right? So it's, you know, it might be more DIY artists, it might be more unsigned artists who are more willing to do this because they want greater exposure. You know, but I do, I would love to see, you know, the, you know, some of the, the bigger artists just saying like, hey, I, I personally want to be part of creating new music experiences. So I'm willing, you know, whether it's the label, the artists, you know, the publisher, all, everyone who needs to come together on these things, you know, I'm willing to kind of put my music out there. But as soon as we start seeing that there's some, you know, some good, you know, streaming consumption going on then that triggers, you know, all the normal licensing, you know, et cetera. So I think there, a lot of the kind of digital innovation licenses um, haven't really been a big priority um, because obviously they're not huge income generators, but I think, you know, we could go the other way and work with DIY artists on these new licensing mechanisms that create uh, these new experiences that we're talking about. So. We have to find ways to allow people to invest in innovation to create, you know, new new products, new experiences, you know, new ways to create commercial businesses that benefits everybody. Cheryl, I know, um, and I don't mean to imply it's an easy business because you don't deal typically in the same uh, streaming licensing environment that we we're talking about with Arun and uh, Angel, but can you talk a little bit about content availability and content creation. I know that's both personally in your scope of responsibilities, but how when your company wants to try a new idea or test out a consumer's reaction, maybe even to a new value proposition, how do you go about determining the content that will go into that innovation or that first time experience? Um, is, it, you, does it, does it, is it known that there are the easier folks to speak to that are already on the platform versus the ones that might be more challenging? Or is it less black and white than what I'm suggesting? 
Um, I think it's, I'm not sure if I'm totally following your questions. I think it's, um, I think it's, uh, you know, we, we essentially do try to provide ways to test out new, new content on the platform. Um, but, you know, is your question around, can you just tell me a little bit more about what you're. Sure. Sure. I think for? one of the, one of the yeah. elements that Angel was picking up on is sometimes it's hard for small companies to innovate on top of music because there's right. a lot of traditional infrastructure and cost and administration that you have to go through just to try an idea or an experience out. And so this idea of lining up verticals without necessarily needing the world's content to start to do things is one aspect, not the only thing she was saying, but one aspect of it. And I wondered how that plays out in your world where both ad-based, but in many cases, maybe DMCA compliant based, experiences, how do you get the consumer's attention to a new type of experience? And where do you get the content from for that? Is it already baked into the rights that you're securing for today's business? Or do you have to go back out and reopen those conversations? Um, well, in some cases, we have to go back out and reopen the conversations for sure. Um, it's sort of, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a case by case basis. But um, we have been trying out some, um, some you know, new innovations where we're trying to sort of uh, put out sort of new um, bundles of content. I think as Angel was indicating before earlier, it's sort of these vertical bundles of content um, that will include both um, DMCA radio play, but also trying to overlay a certain level of um, sort of customized um, experiences or ability for artists to um, ability for artists to include sort of voice tracks, for example. So I think um, so. I think there's a so, so we're kind of constantly doing testing to try to mm. figure out sort of how to surface the right content to the right listeners. Um, but uh, you know, but as far as like whether it requires additional rights conversations, it's it's really it's on a case by case basis. Got it. Okay. I am, I am being given the wave at us for time. So I'm going to ask each of you to, to weigh in on the same topic. Um, and it's one that you can take in any direction that you want. Are you looking at even non-entertainment categories um, that are going to be disrupted or are ripe for disruption that you think music and streaming could play a role? Uh, you know, a former example of this might have been in the pre-ride sharing days, you know, who would have said, we're going to put together your personal account, attach it to your Uber account so that your music travels with you when you jump into an Uber, right? There's an example of that. Are there, are there things to come to mind that you're watching that are categories ripe for disruption? And should we be, and how should we be thinking about making sure that music consumption is central that, to that behavior down the road? Maybe I'll, Arun, start with you. Um, on that yeah. Um you know, the way I see it, um, and I've got a seven year old, uh, and you know, the attention span of the seven years to even like 20 year olds now <laughs> is not beyond five seconds, right? So <laughs> um, it's really hard for, you know, for me to get her to sit down and watch a two hour Disney movie. So, um, so the way I see it, obviously, you know, the, to, you know to, to bring up the stickiness, uh, we will have to you know, somehow look at a way that, you know, how we can actually integrate with this short form uh, video platforms or, uh, well, yeah, I mean, video is going to be key for us. We're, we're still looking at, you know, how, uh, whether it's going to be a long form video content or short form, but I do see that there is definitely going to be some kind of an amalgamation there. Thank you. Angel, what are your thoughts? Um, I think all of the streaming services, regardless of, of you know the nature of the content whether it's you know video long form short form uh meditation you know you name it i think they're all challenged with this question of differentiation so i think that there could be lots of opportunity to create more personalization and not just commercial bundles but bundling of different types of content. So I think it'll be interesting to see how we can uh, look at the consumer, not just from our own kind of specific lens, but their total, you know, streaming consumption and ways that we can personalize those uh, experiences around uh, what they want. 
and we have to anticipate those wants and desires as well because a lot of people don't tell you exactly what they want so you have to experiment so i hope that we get to a stage where we're experimenting more right on cheryl so I, I completely agree with Angel. I think in terms of those um, vertical, those bundles are really going to be key um, and essentially like a, ensuring a, a sort of seamless transition from sort of one, uh, from sort of listening in one place to listening to the next, to listening into the next and being able to sort of personalize um, that audio content and those bundles with whether someone wants to listen to you know, news in the car and then get walk in the door and listen to music and then sort of wake up in the morning and start, um, you know, hearing the latest sort of sports. I think, I think it's sort of like tailoring those personalized bundles and also tailoring them to the, the uh, space the listener is in at the moment is really, uh, um, you know, what we need to start focusing on. Well, there's nothing like listening to people who have really done it. So I just want to express my thanks to each of you for joining in the conversation and sharing your thoughts on this. And Paul, we'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Mike. And sorry, um, we're just, we just so, so over time, so we're going to have to wrap quite quickly. We've got to get you off to, to the meetings, Mike. I think there's still a few slots left, but um, hopefully you'll be able to get to your, get to your first meeting. Okay. If you can, if you can. I'll jump yeah. there now. Yeah, do. Thank, thanks very, very much. And thanks to all of the speakers today. I hope uh, you've enjoyed those, those sessions. Um, let's just uh, very quickly wrap up here and see what, um, what's going to be happening tomorrow. If we can. Okay, so that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's for today. And there are some slots in the um, chat there uh, left uh, if you do want to have a quick chat uh, with, with MQA, but you have to do, have to do that right now. Please put them up right now. Um, let's see what we're going to be doing tomorrow. So tomorrow we look at evolution of platforms where we focus in on, well, I mean, essentially five different platforms, really. We're going to kick off uh, with a panel looking at the evolution of podcasts. Then uh, we, with the next three, well, in fact, all of the sessions, we've got collaborations from um, all the various companies. So we've got um, focus on Twitch. Uh, then we have uh, Paul Hurricane from TikTok. Uh, then we have a YouTube session. And finally, we're going to hear from Lars Eptrup from, uh, from Linkfire, uh, one of our sponsors, and an opportunity to meet uh, chart metric and link fire at the end of the day so that's everything for today sorry that we overran a little bit sorry for my interjection earlier on and um yes do come back again same time uh, tomorrow and uh, enjoy uh, enjoy the rest of the event thank you